Hey everyone, uh, happy to welcome you here to our latest e Ediciones online workshop. Today we are going to talk about common XSDB TI publisher deployment scenarios. And the talk will be given by me, Lars Windauer, and Olaf Schreck. Hello. And we are both working for Access Solutions. Uh, we, the talk will be split in three parts uh, with a focus for editors, developers, and system administrators. After each part, there will be room for quick questions. If you have questions, uh, please use the raise your hand icon in Jitsi. It's at the bottom of Jitsi on the left, the hand you can see there. Um, we will provide you a very rough overview of XSDB and TI Publisher, but really rough because we assume everyone here knows both products. Um, then go through the different roles and what deployment means for editors, developers, and system administrators. We won't be able to cover any deployment scenario of XSDB and TI Publisher, because there are simply too many, but we will concentrate on the most common one, at least from our perspective at XS Solutions. So let's jump in. Quick overview of XSDB. XSDB is an XML database, but meanwhile, it's more than this. Uh, as our title on our homepage says, it's an all-in-one solution for application building. And we have developed all different kinds of applications based on XSDB as TI Publisher, uh, for example. It's open source and it runs on any system Java does run on, so mainly li Linux, Unix, Mac OS, and Windows. You will need Java to run XSDB, minimum version 8 for a, the current 5.0 release. You should have at least 200 megabytes of free disk space and 512 megabytes of RAM, so it would run, and it does run on a Raspberry Pi, tested that, but it's not that big fun, to be honest. So a little bit more disk space and RAM and a, a modern CPU is more fun here. TI Publisher is a product uh, we built on top of XSDB. Uh, it's our instant publishing toolbox. It was the main focus was uh, for publishing TI, but it is capable of rendering any kind of markup like docbook or easy detail or whatever you want to render. Uh, it's open source itself and based on all kind of open source standards and open standards. It was mainly written or is mainly written in XQuery and uh, web components nowadays. Both are standards by the WC3, the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, TI Publisher has mainly one dependency, and that is XSDB. To run the latest TI Publisher 6 release, you will need at latest uh, at least XSDB 5.0. So let's jump in at the different deployment scenarios, uh, how to run and deploy XSDB for editors. <clears throat> and here, the easiest way uh, to simply start off as fast as possible is Docker, which is a virtualization software which le lets you uh, deliver, which delivers software packages in so called containers. And if you run a container, it's called an image. Um, so I put up on the slides here the download link for Docker. You need to install it and start it. Uh, when you start it, it will uh, show up as an icon in your menu bar, probably in the upper right. And once it's running, you need to call, you have to call docker pull xsdb slash ti publisher, uh, sorry, colon latest. And that will download the 
latest TI publisher image to your local machine. And when you want to start it for the first time, you need to call Docker Run. Uh, there is Docker Start and Stop as well. We'll talk about this in a second. But the very first time you are running an image, it has to be Docker Run uh, with the minus P option, which is used for port mapping. So XSDB usually always runs on port 8080 for HTTP and 8443 for HTTPS. And but that are the ports within the image. And you want to map these now to ports you can access with your browser. And in this case here, I used 8081 uh, for my local machine and for the HTTPS port 80, uh, 8444. Then the other options you will want to use is the minus V option which creates a access data volume to make sure your data you store in the database is on an extra volume. This is necessary in case you want to upgrade, update the TI publisher version, and uh, which would mean you are downloading a complete new image and you, all your data would be lost. And to make sure your data does not get lost, we recommend to use a uh, named volume like we show here. And you should provide the concrete image a name, which you can do with the, the minus minus name option. I use TI Publisher in my sample. That's how it's in, stated in the readme as well. And once the command is finished, uh, you will be able to browse the latest TI Publisher on your local machine, so local host, uh, colon 8081 slash exist slash app slash TI publisher. And that's it. And you can start working in your browser. I put up some useful Docker commands on the slides here. The slides will be made available after the presentation. So you can use them to review things. Uh, yeah, as once you have. Uh, started the Docker image using Docker Run. You can stop it with Docker Stop and the given selected name. If you then want to start it again, don't use Docker Run again. It would say, oh, there is already a TI publisher uh, image. So from then on, you use Docker Start. If you're interested in the ExistDB log files, you can use Docker Logs uh, with Docker Container PS minus a you can see all running and stop com containers and if you are interested in copying your exist data out of the image on your local machine you can use docker cp uh, address the data image just like it shown here and the dot here uh, means your current working directi directory could be any path on your local machine. I put up some more information uh, on the slides for you. So links to more information and a list. And you can find a list of the already available Docker TI publisher images here. So in some scenarios, uh, you might not want to use Docker. For example, uh, we have sadly experienced that there are some performance limitations, not on Linux. Uh, I'm not sure about Windows, but on Mac for sure. Uh, the search and some other operations are quite slow. And so it was not that fun to develop our applications on Docker on a Mac system where I'm on. And in that case, you want to use an XSDB release. Uh, simply go to the exist-db.org homepage. There you have a download section where you can download the latest stable release. The current stable release is 5.2.0. And once you have downloaded it, yeah, it, uh, it will take you to a download site where you will find uh, .dmg file for Mac OS systems, uh, minus win.zip for Windows, and for all other operating system, and as they work for 
uh, as well for Mac and Windows, a uh, .jar installer, because it would be too much to go through all operating systems now. I'm here showing how to use the .jar installer. So you will, if you download the exist minus installer minus 5.2.0 zero dot jar file you can simply go double click that file or open in your console open your console uh, cd to that file and call java minus jar which will bring up the icpack installation routine for xsdb and then simply click through the installation routine by clicking next and the default property property set there should be already fine for you. I won't cover this in detail now. It's pretty obvious. Once you've installed it, depending on your operating system, for Windows and Linux users, you will have an XSDB entry in your start menu um, and a desktop icon if you selected that option during installation. On macOS, uh, if you did not change anything, you will find it in slash application slash XSDB and can simply double click it there. Uh, sorry, one second, I need to mute someone. Um, so that's the easiest way to start XSDB. You can also, there are some alternatives. Uh, if you look into the XSDB installation directory, you will find a file start.jar there. You can simply double click that or from a console call java minus jar start.jar and that will also open the launcher and you will have a XSDB menu icon in your menu bar. As an alternative, you could also step into the XSDB install, uh, folder after installation and call bin slash launcher.sh for Linux and Mac or bin backslash launcher.bat for Windows systems. Um, now, since we don't have Docker, we have the uh, ports which are usually used by XSDB. So it will be port 8080 for HTTP and you would now have a naked XSDB. And to install the TI publisher now, you want to go to the package manager there, click on the available tab, scroll down to TI publisher and click on the arrow down symbol here, and it will install you a TI publisher version six. And afterwards, you can simply open it in your browser on your local machine. Um, I have some slides here to show you what happens if you start XSDB the first time. You will see this configuration window where you can configure min and max memory, caches, caches the data directory, and the ports. Uh, unless you don't have that much, much memory, uh, and have to change max memory, I would definitely recommend to not change anything here if you are not certain what you are doing, because usually the default properties here are make very much sense, even for production systems. But if you want to, you have the option. Here on the right, you can see how it looks on a Mac, where you have the XSDB icon in your menu bar, and from there on, you can start and stop the server, uh, open this window, the system configuration, uh, open the dashboard, our XML editor, Excite, the Java admin client you might want to use uh, to set a password for the admin user or any other users, open our monitoring tool, Monex, and uh, it will be able to open the exist log files, which is especially interesting if you experience any issues. Uh, the exist log is usually the first place to look. So after you confirmed this dialog on the left was safe uh, and go to the package manager, you will be asked for your credentials. So a fresh empty XSDB instance always has uh, no password set for the admin user. So it would be admin as a user and no password. Uh, log in there 
then you will here you have the already mentioned available tab and if you scroll down there you see ti publisher 6 click here on download and install afterwards it will be available in your dashboard and from there you can click and are directly taking taken into the latest ti publisher so um, the public repo from where the ti publisher application cam came from if there's any update like a 6.1 or 7 the package manager would notify you that there's a new newer version available and you can easily decide to install that newer version but please be aware that if you made any custom changes and you install a newer version of the publisher uh, they will be gone so make sure to save them before um there are some other options which might be interesting um so thanks to joe we have a homebrew formula that's something for mac users so on a mac you could simply run brew cask install xsdb which will also install the latest xsdb versions and for sure there are many other installation modes just like a headless installation or to install xsdb as a service uh, which are listed under the link down here or thanks to adam ratter uh, we also have nightly builds um, from the xsdb development branch but please be aware to only use them on your own risk because that's as the name says a development branch and there uh, not everything is fully tested there so that would be the xsdb ti publisher deployment for editors part any questions so far i don't see any hands up so i would simply continue with the xsdb ti publisher for developers part um there are many reasons why you might not want to only go with a xsdb or ti publisher release uh, for example there could be new features uh, which have not been released yet so for example when wolfgang developed the facets uh, he did his in his own git repo at the beginning then it lived uh, for a while on the xsdb developer branch in github and uh, was only released uh, in a real release with 5.0.0 rc8 that's why the top publisher 5 in august 2019 stated that you need that release to run it another issue could be that you experience any bugs and see in our github repos or mailing list or somewhere else that these have been already fixed but the fix didn't made it yet in any new release because we can't provide a release for every bug fix and then you might be in a situation where you want to run either ti publisher or xsdb from source um we will this time start with the ti publisher so for example here we can see that wolfgang and magdar already committed some smaller fixes for the autocomplete in august 2020 uh, so after the ti publisher release and if you experience any issue here might be worth to take a look if you want to build the ti publisher from source you will need git on your local machine uh, java you need anyway uh, to run xsdb so i assume you have it already and you will need apache ant and then it's pretty straightforward and easy as you might have noticed uh, the ti publisher application the lib and all other uh, libraries around ti publisher were moved to e editions this part so what you do is you call git clone and then the url to the git repository you want to you want to clone and once you cloned it you can step into the ti publisher app 
the folder that will be created. And there you simply run ant once. Afterwards, uh, it will build you a TI Publisher XAR file, which where you can then upload to XSDB again through the package manager, as you see here. Uh, I have it here as a screenshot. That's how a Git clone looks like. So it will download all the different artifacts. Once it's finished, I step into the TI Publisher app, call Ant here, and as you can see, it packaged up everything together. And the result, the TI Publisher minus 6.0.0.xar will be stored in the build folder within TI Publisher app. So, and that XAR file you can directly upload into the via the package manager into XSDB. Um, there is another specialty. So the TI Publisher not only requires other, li other libraries, for example, like the TI Publisher lib, which is, will pull itself without that you notice. Um, there is the TI Publisher components. We often refer to it as PB components. Um, and this is loaded from an external servers, external servers. So there might be scenarios where you want to use uh, the TI Publisher offline, so it must not connect to a CDN, or you want to use another version of PB components because there have been some shiny new web components or fixes. Then you might want uh, to make the TI Publisher work with the latest PB components version. Uh, to do so, you will need Node.js, uh, which will install you several small programs. NPM is one of them. And what you have to do is, in your TI Publisher app, go to build.properties.xml and uh, reference the path to where your NPM is installed. Afterwards, go and store the file again, for sure. Afterwards, uh, go to your package.json file. And there you can say with which, with which version of PB components you want to work. So this is a meanwhile older version. Um, the current version is 1.3.0 for example, and if you want to test that, you can simply change it here. And you have to make sure uh, that you <clears throat> change the config X query. So in modules slash config.xqm, you will find a variable dollar $config uh, hyphen web components, the colon web components, sorry. Uh, and that should point to local. Once you've done all these changes, you can simply run aunt again, but this time with an extra argument, uh, aunt xar minus local, and that will create a xar file which loads all the web components from this xar file and not from the uh, CDN anymore. So here I have it in very short. And the difference compared to the other ARN call is mainly the NPM calls, which you can see here. And that's why you need Node.js. And as you can see here in this line, it will create as well a TI publisher minus 6.0.0.xar file. And you can upload it via the XSDB package manager, just like for the other versions. So I already mentioned the facets. And uh, in some cases, you might want to be able to use a feature like this, which has not been released already. And you will want to install XSDB from source. To do so, you again need Git. Java is already installed because you are running XSDB anyway. And the other tool you will need now is Apache Maven, at least version 3. And from there on, it's pretty straightforward again. So again, we have to clone the repository. 
cd into the just created folder exist. And now we use Maven to package up everything. Um, the minus D skip tests argument here is very important, uh, unless you have lots of time and want to see how all tests run green, hopefully, um, because I think executing the test takes at least something like 20 minutes. So the, even in our documentation, we usually recommend uh, if you just want to build the source to skip the test, which you can do with this flag. Um, once the Maven is finished, which, which will take a few minutes, uh, you will find various artifacts in different places. So all the compiled XSDB versions will be placed in the exist minus distribution slash target folder. We'll show you this in a second. And uh, next to it, you will have an XSDB installer in case you want to provide this to others, um, which is stored in exist minus installer slash, slash targets. There are much more and more build options, which you can find later under this link if you go through it on your own. And there's lots of documentation available. If we take a quick look in the exist distribution folder slash target. Uh, we have again the artifacts we already know from our binary releases, because that's in the, in the end how we build a release as well. You have a .dmg file um, to be, you can use to, to provide it to anyone who's using a Mac OS device, and he can simply install it there or she. Uh, the my the minus dir directory is simply a compiled but unpicked xsdb you can directly start off from as it is placed there and you will find the tar.bz2 files for unix and linux systems the minus win.zip file which is a zipped compiled xsdb intended for windows users and a dot app version so you can open it directly and run it as a mac os application there are some further um, uh, directories in that target folder you can simply ignore a quick word about uh, xsdb branches so when you clone xsdb for the first time it will, our default branch is the develop branch where we um, merge the latest bug fixes, prepare upcoming features and everything. Um, <clears throat> so if you build from there, you yeah, have the latest version which will be used for the next release. So I think I, I never experienced a situation where something that was already on develop would not go into the next release, um, but it might take a while until it ends up in the release. If you want to be to build um, the current release of XSDB or perhaps even a former one, you should switch to the master branch. That's where the releases are, the developed branches are merged to once we release. In some rare cases, you might uh, be, or let's say different, when the XSDB developers plan new features or provide bug fixes, we usually fork XSDB. So here, for example, is a screenshot from Wolfgang uh, and his exist fork from XSDB. And that's where he developed the Lucene facets, for example. So you could find in the beginning, you could find them nowhere else than on Wolfgang's fork. Um, but if you are, and if you are interested to give it already a preview and want to build that uh, feature on top of XSDB or in XSDB, including that feature, you need to add that other fork and to uh, add a different in, in Git speak. It's another remote. You can have multiple remotes. And to add a remote, you use git remote add, then provide a name, in this case, Wolfgang. 
and the path to the Git repository. Once you added that, you can call git fetch minus minus all, which will have a look at all remotes if there are any changes, any new things. And uh, afterwards, you can use Git to check out the Lucene feature. Uh, as I show here, with the minus B option, I can provide a name on myself, uh, point to the remote Wolfgang, and there choose the feature Lucene uh, facet. And afterwards, just build my XSDB as I just showed. And I will be able to have Lucene facets before everyone else. So that was the development part. Any concrete questions about development? Uh... Ah, I read a question here if, um, for OS X, if there is uh, one installation method to be preferred over the other. I would say not really, because it's mainly uh, what you like thing. I know many people who rather use their mouse, and they would always want to use the uh, released version and use the .dmg, which gets installed to on a Mac slash applications, and then double click the .app version there. Um, me personal, I do prefer to work in a console or terminal, so I would always, yeah, I'm mainly working from source and uh, build the XSDB I need and start it up from source. So it's not that easy to answer the question, but usually uh, it has to do with what's your intent, uh, what are you planning to do. If there are no further questions, I would switch to the third part. XSDB for sysadmins. So Lars has shown a basic installation of XSDB and TI Publisher by downloading the installer and then manually clicking to install Exist and also clicking in the dashboard to install the TI Publisher application. Um, various other tasks remain that need to be done manually as well. Most important, um, the default passwords of exist have to be uh, set, especially the admin password, which, which is blank at the, at the default install. Also, we might want to install additional apps like TI Publisher from the, from the uh, web GUI, from the dashboard. And we might want to configure exist in more detail, like um, setting the amount of memory or um, adding uh, some things to config ML. Finally, we also might have to prepare the server operating system, for example, to um, install Exist as a service so that it gets restarted automat automatically when the server reboots. And we might need to do some other adjustments like um, increasing the file descriptor limits which may lead to problems um, on loaded servers. All this is a repetitive and error-prone process, especially when we're dealing with multiple servers. Um, it's fine to do this on a single server once manually, but um, consider the uh, situation where we want to run two identical XSDB instances behind a load balancer. So we need to make sure both instances are really configured the same. Um, so if we do this manually, it's quite easy to omit or forget a certain step, and then these systems run out of sync. And this is especially important um, when uh, handling a number of exist systems in different environments, such as uh, development, profing, or production, um, can be automated with Ansible. For those who don't know Ansible, it is a tool for configuration management, application deployment, and task automation. 
in our exist context, this means we will use Ansible to automate the installation of exist and Nginx and Java, and also to automatically configure the system, for example, adjusting configuration files. Um, Ansible works by um, declaring a desired server state. This means um, we might want to have certain users installed. We might want to have uh, certain services running, certain packages be available on the system, or certain files to have um, specific content. Um, this, all this can be executed by Ansible. Um, Ansible has procedures to bring the server into the desired state. Um, this is done by um, Ansible tasks. A typical example would be uh, we create one user. Um, then in a second task, we create a directory that belongs to this user. And in a third task, we create a file inside the directory, which is also owned by this user. So these three tasks would, tasks would be combined into a playbook. Um, playbook is an Ansible term for joining tasks together in bigger units. Ansible also has a concept of roles. This is useful for similar parameterized instances of things. For example, like an exist data, uh, database that should be mostly identical on two different servers except for some parameters like the port number or the installation directory or similar things. We have created an Ansible role for exist. This is uh, the exist Ansible role we, we will later use in the demo session. And it's um, open source and public, publicly available on GitHub. So now I would like to run a short live session to show how to get from scratch to an installed TI publisher instance by using just one Ansible command. And it, this will take about five minutes. Um, we have been given a bare Ubuntu server to install exist on. And we need uh, three things to use Ansible for that. So first, we need SSH access to the system. Then we need. Um, uh, sudo writes to become root because we need to install various things as root. And also we need Python installed. So uh, because that is required by Ansible. So now I'm gonna switch to the shell. Okay, here I have a shell on a host of exist solutions. And I'm going to log in to the test server. I need to fetch the password. So we have access to the system. Um, we can become root. And um, Python is installed. It can either be Python 2 or Python 3, it doesn't matter. So to show this server is really empty, um, I'm going to show you that there is no exist installation directory. Also, there's no Java installed. Java not found. And Nginx is not running. So now I'm going to jump back to the exist host. And I will run the Ansible command, which is Ansible playbook, which is a command to run a, a playbook, of course. I will limit this to the server I just mentioned and log into. And I'll specify which playbook to run. We have a wrapper playbook, which is called MK server or make server. Um, which combines various single playbooks like uh, setting up exist, preparing the system before, uh, in the end, uh, set up Nginx and uh, monitoring agents and all this. So this single call runs all these playbooks 
one after the other. So, of course, it asks me for the SSH key again. And now it starts to run. Um, I don't want to uh, explain everything that this is doing. Um, it will take about five minutes. Um, and I will return to the slides for now. And we'll come back to this uh, shell in a few minutes. So we ran an Ansible playbook called Make Server against this single host. And uh, this playbook did a few things one after the other. First, it, is, uh, it prepared the operating system. Uh, for example, it did install some packages that we use for debugging, and it installed an administration user that we use to manage the running exist. Um, it, the playbook could opt optionally set up firewall, SSA protection, and TLS certificates. Um, in some situations, for example, when you run a server at a hoster on your own, um, you will want to set up the firewall and SSH protection. Uh, but in other cases, such as um, university deployments, um, there's often an IT team that manage, manages all this. So we don't want to interfere with that. This is why that's optional. Mm -hmm. Then the main task was uh, installing and configuring an XSTP instance. This included um, setting, preparing the system some more specifically for exist, like adding some utils. Um, then we installed exist from an archive. Alternatively, we can also exist from source code. Then we um, went on to configure ExistDB. There are certain files that uh, are uh, touched by Ansible to set up uh, values like uh, the amount of RAM or the HTTP and TLS ports that it is listening on and stuff like that. Um, then ExistDB was started for the first time and uh, uh, installed some packages. Some of these packages come by exist uh, come with exist by default, and uh, some packages are configured as custom packages. In this case, this is the TI publisher application and uh, library. Um, finally, we also cared to harden exist, especially setting passwords other than the default passwords. Then the Playbook went on to set up monitoring agents for the server operating system and for the exist instance. Um, these are agents that will be used with our monitoring tools to check the uh, health of the installed system. And finally, in the end, we set up an Nginx front-end proxy in front of this XSDB instance because it is uh, in, generally, in general recommended to run a lightweight front-end proxy because um, the XSTB stack with Jetty is quite heavyweight and uh, it's quite easy to filter out unwanted uh, web scanning with a front-end proxy such as Nginx. So now we take a short look at the Playbook execution. Oh, it's still not done. This is a stage where it had installed exist and now fires it, fires it up for the first time. Okay, so now it proceeds with uh, post installation stuff like setting the admin password in this case. Now it is installing the TI publisher XAR files. So we're at the last steps, Nginx gets installed. And now we're ready and we should be able to see a running exist after executing just this single command. Okay, so now time to fire up the browser with the new exist instance. We see the greeting screen. And there's the 
as the instance. Um, first, I would like to show that the default password for admin does not work. By default, this is um, user admin and an empty password, which is wrong. So this is just to show that the password has been set, of course. And um, here we can just click on the TI publisher to run it. So one command exists full up and running. OK, back to the slides. OK, um, I'd like to mention um, two things that are important for Ansible. One of this uh, is the concept of item potency, which basically means um, if we run Ansible multiple times, it will always create the same server state. So we have just run it for the first time. We, can, we could immediately rerun Ansible now, and it would notice, um, OK, everything has been set up, so I don't have to do anything. This is the de desired server state. And this is quite useful to detect modifications or config discrepancies between um, the current state of the host and the desired state of the host. For example, someone might have modified the configuration as a quick change, but did not um, push these changes back into Ansible. So Ansible, Ansible would notice um, there have been some changes that don't match its configuration. And it will revert these changes to the correct state as seen by Ansible. So this is really useful to notice um, if a system has changed or, or um, has changed um, from the desired state. Another important thing with Ansible is the idea of Ansible vaults. Um, we often have to use uh, passwords, keys, or Privacy, privacy tokens that are sensitive information and that must not be stored in clear text configuration repositories. But as we, you have seen, we have set an Ansible admin password at least, so we need to store this somehow. And for this, Ansible has a built-in mechanism. It's called the vault. It's basically AES-256 encryption um, so after decryption, um, these are just normal Ansible variables, but as seen from the outside, it's just a blob of encryption data. So this was a quick rundown on Ansible and its basic ideas. Um, there are a lot of things that we did not cover in this short time. Um, one of these is uh, we can have multiple XSDB installations on the same host, um, all of them installed by Ansible just the way we saw it before. We also did not cover the installation of other XSTB related software, such as ActiveMQ for replication, the Cantaloupe IIIF server, or the Jenkins CI server. Also, um, we apply monitoring and performance testing tools to exist, but these are out of scope for this discussion today. And we did not cover performance tuning of exist because um, that is, this is really too different for each system. At the end uh, of the slides, you will find further information. Um, these are clickable links. Um, feel free to contact us by email or on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>